Lottie. And I'm Mark. And this is Showtime Shenanigans. That was a really aggressive start. I'm really sorry for that. Um, today, we have a very exciting interview. Oh, up. oh, we do. I meant to say episode. Oh, screwed it over. Oh, well. I do we'll absolutely silly goose. We are talking to David Loud, who is a musical director slash actor, which we'll find out. Slash out, genius. Slash writer um, uh, from Broadway, which hey. is so exciting. It's our first American. How do you feel? I know. Um, so before we get into the interview, we're going to do our segments quickly and then we will hop on hop over. On. So do you want to start? Well, actually... Or is it normally me? It's usually you, oh. but like, I don't mind starting because like, actually no, you should start because you're using your memory and I'm not using my memory. I am using my memory. Don't even have the book today, guys. It's, it's a wild going off the book. <laughs> mm, off book. You're not meant to do that. Joking. Um, no meant to do that. You're meant to do that when you've been practicing for three weeks, and I haven't. I no. came up with it this morning. So, keychain jar of the week yeah. is revolting children from Matilda. We are revolting children. Such a ball. Such a ball. <laughs> <laughs> are you tired? Um. Anyways, so the key change is after the big bit in the middle. <laughs> the big bit in the middle. They're like. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 with the claps and everything and it goes oh ooh, and it's got a little like, echo oh. <laughs> and then it's we are revolting children and that is it one, <laughs> <clears throat> one minute 59 headphone users mark's got to think of the headphone users <laughs> so sorry that you have to listen to this trash <laughs> You sing revolting rhymes for being revolting children. When does Matilda open? Do we know? This is Randola. My gosh. Maybe like July? July? Maybe? Julie? Because I would love to know. Mark's going to have a look quickly. So I'll just continue talking about Matilda. Bogies. Great. Um, Have you seen Matilda? You've seen Matilda. I've seen it once. Once. I've seen it once too. I went with Naomi. Hi Naomi, if you're listening. Mark literally has the. I keep looking over there. It's because the poster's there. It's a it's a long one, isn't it? It's a long because it's like a it was like a square. It was a rectangle yeah. one, but it's like a one that um, falls out all over itself. But yeah, returns September twenty twenty one. Is there a date or just September? Just September. So they haven't set a date yet. Well, they no, but they've, they've announced the cast today. Yes, I saw that. How exciting. I know. I wouldn't know looking at them if it was the same people from last oh, time or not. Cool. Not got a Scooby. But There's it, some people that are the same, I think. It's a great... So, is there a Broadway cast recording? Yes, there is, and it's tragic. Yes, I was going to say, I was like, I was pretty sure that that was one of the shows where you said to me, you were like, listen to the... Listen, I'm talking years ago, can I just say? it's the not like a End cast, don't listen to the Broadway cast. Yes. Yeah. I'm just putting it out there. This was years and years ago. This was not like last week. <laughs> it's all good. There's a Holland version of it as well. A Holland version? Do you mean a Dutch version? No. Holland. Yeah, it, that's Dutch. That's so in, this that's is Holland. In the Netherlands. Yeah, Holland is like a tiny section of the Netherlands. Yeah, no, but so is London, but it's a tiny part of... So it's actually in holland yeah great anyway that's a fun factorino for you speaking of fun factorinos mark <laughs> we touched hands touching, uh, hands. touching me touching, touching you, you. Ooh, sweet bum, bum, square pants. yes bum, bum, bum. go so my fun fact of this week is about spongebob square pants the musical why do you not always do that? I'm sorry. I hate, I, hate, I hate wish I was like the new musical or like, the, like in, you know, like when like soundtracks have like, or like when, on like the bottom the of the brand program. new musical. Yeah. SpongeBob. Like the hit musical. Wicked. And you're just like, it's like, oh. It's just a musical. Calm down. I mean, like, yes, obviously, it is Matilda a hit. the musical, Wicked the musical the makes musical. sense. Yeah, but when they're like the smash hit, the Broadway award winning. Yeah, you know, like I, make, it's I just, just want to say it weirdly. Oh my god, like, music! Like, wow. wow, so SpongeBob, the music! Wow, it is, it is SpongeBob SquarePants musical, but like I just it, I that's not an annoying one, but you do no, it anyway I just because hate it it's anyway. so it's SpongeBob. Like you're not going to say it correctly, are you? SpongeBob. Anyway, it's a one of the kind, a Broadway musical with original Stop. songs. Stop! Stop <laughs> normally. They're not going to know what you're saying. SpongeBob, SpongeBob SquarePants musical is a one of a kind Broadway show. With original songs written by Joe Perry from Arrow Smith, Sarah Bareilles from Sarah <laughs> and Cindy Lauper, John Legend, 
what a legend. Panic. Panic at the, the disco. disco. Plain oh, white tees. tees. David Bowie and many, many Oh, more. you were Bowie. I say Bowie. But that's Bowie. because I'm Bow Brick. So, like, I just, naturally would go Bow. My mum would say Bowie. Ba- David Bowie. My mum would say Bowie. Yeah. So, like, I'm going to say Bowie because she's a Oh, yeah, fan. that's fine. You you go for it. I just would say Bowie naturally. But I don't know what it actually is. Bowie. Oh, Bowie. is it? Has it been confirmed? Historically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> historically ac- um, accurate. We've talked about Spongebob before. Is there yeah. A- is there a pro shot? There's a, they've done a pro shot of it, but only on Nickelodeon. I mean, that's just uh, segregation. I don't have Sky, so I can't watch Nickelodeon. Oh, Travis. Anyway, without further ado, further ado, ado. <laughs> without further ado, uh, this week's actor of the hour is David Loud. Because <laughs> I thought that that would just be easier to, yeah, to do. Because um, he was an actor, and he's writing a memoir, which he will talk about in the interview. Um, and that is why we are talking to him today. So, And if there are any pre-order links, we'll put it down below at the end of the podcast. Yeah, if there's a pre-order link, we'll link it down below. If it's not out yet, I'll just add it in, in the we'll links below. We'll talk about it in the future. We'll talk about it when the links come yeah. out, and I'll add it to this video if anyone's w- found this near the time of the book coming out. Yes. Does that make sense? So it might not be there right now, but it might be there right now. So, so without further ado, yes. let's get into it. Let's... So, hi, how is it going? Terrific, I'm so glad to speak with you. Fabulous. Okay, do you want to ask the first question? Well, I can. Not that one. Not that one. Uh, hey, so <laughs> for people that don't know who you are, could you give us a small little introduction to yourself? Sure. My name is David Loud, and I uh, was a Broadway music director for 34 years on Broadway, uh, working, conducting Broadway shows and working as music director on a lot of music, uh, new musicals, revivals, and uh, reviews, all sorts of things um, in New York. Uh, and more recently, I've been working as a teacher at Manhattan School of Music. Uh, I teach a history of musical theater course and uh, song performance there. And uh, I've written a book about my time as a Broadway music director. Yeah. It's called Facing the Music, and it comes out uh, Christmas time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Exciting. Um, <laughs> what was I going to say? I feel like I had something. Oh, I was going to say history of music, musical theatre sounds like a really fun course. I mean, for me, maybe. <laughs> Some people might not find it interesting, but <laughs> I'd love that. It was, a great, it was a great experience to put it together. Uh, I certainly learned a lot uh, teaching it for the first time. I've now taught it four times and I'm still learning amazing things each year. But it's, I sort of constructed the course to reflect the way I fell in love with musical theater. I make my students read all the same books that I read that um, inspired me. Books like Act One by Moss Hart and Alan J. Lerner's book, The Street Where I Live. Uh, And I just make them listen to all the musicals that I fell in love with as a kid, and we discuss them and put them in the the order of the Pantheon. uh, I start with Gilbert and Sullivan and end with Ragtime, which is basically the year that my came out the year that my students were born. (laughs) Okay, fair (laughs) enough. (laughs) Okey dokes. Um, So, how how did you discover your love for Broadway? Um, How did you get into it? You know, I think some people are just destined to have that dream inside them, no matter where they're born. They could be born in, you know, in a cave in Samoa, and they're going to end up on Broadway if that's what that little um, fire inside says. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, and my parents uh, were teachers. My father was a math teacher. Uh, my mom you know, worked with arts and crafts with kids. And I just knew that I needed to be somewhere other than Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, it, my parents had a, a record player and, you know, 25 Broadway shows in their collection, the way most middle-class Americans did at that time. You know, My Fair Lady, starting with that one, and, um, you know, Guys and Dolls and Oklahoma and South Pacific and Brigadoon and uh, all the big ones. Yeah. I just listened to them over and over and over and thought that I had to be there because that kind of music made me happy. And 
I was very lucky in my life in that I, I had teachers who inspired and encouraged me from the very beginning. My, my first piano teacher, um, gave notes to me in exactly the way I like to give notes to actors, you know, um, complimenting them on something and then helping them fix something. Yeah. Uh, I remember she would always say to me, you know, you missed that E flat. You have to play that E flat, but my goodness, your rhythm is exactly right leading up to it. You know, and, um, there was a teacher at, uh, the school I went to that, uh, noticed that I was interested in, in theater and he worked with the high school girls. And so when I was six years old, I played the boy in Waiting for Godot with the high school girls. And um, it was just magical for me. I loved, I loved everything about the theater. And I was determined to get there. My family moved to Lake Placid, New York. Um, and my parents were teachers at a, a school called the North Country School, which is on an organic farm up in the Adirondacks. And those that, that school was all about, you know, compost piles and working in the garden and climbing mountains. And uh, it was not a preparatory school for musical theater in New York City. No, not really. So I, I started plotting my escape from the world of <laughs> um, organic farming. Uh, I had a grandmother, my, my father's mother lived in New York City and she loved theater and I would save all my money and go spend a week with her and sleep on her couch. And we would see as many Broadway shows as we could cram into the week. Nice. If you're clever, you know, more than eight. Um, and, and I just sort of geared my life towards getting to New York city to, to, to do it. And I think if you, if you just keep trying, you get there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> That sounds really cool. Like coming from somewhere that's just not, not geared towards the musical theatre world, and then you just make your way. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Well, I, I, as I said, I was very lucky. I had teachers who, who helped, helped with that dream. When I got to North Country School, there was a wonderful piano teacher there, who wrote a musical every year, based on what talent he could find in the in the school that year. You know. Oh. If there was a kid who reminded him of Cleopatra, he would write a musical about Cleopatra that year. And uh, he was terrific. He wrote great shows. And I just wanted to be in, in his shows first. And then um, that led to Dreams of Broadway. Yeah, you, you, um, you were an actor first, weren't you, I think? I started out that way, yes. I, I was very lucky um, very early in my life when I was... 18, I went to the open call for Mary Libby Roll Along on Broadway, the Stephen Sondheim, George Firth musical that was directed by Harold Prince. And from that open call, I was cast in the show. They needed somebody who could play the piano for one of the small parts. And so from that open call, I went to maybe five more auditions over the, over the next couple of weeks. Um, as they narrowed down you know, this huge outpouring of people who wanted to be in Mary Lou would roll along. Uh, it was the musical that Sondheim and Prince were working on right after Sweeney Todd. And they were looking for a young, young cast. I think that they wanted uh, 15 to 25 in, to be the age range. And when I got to New York to stand on that line to audition, the, the actors were about 15 to 65, I would say all trying to look very, very young. Uh, <laughs> but uh, even though the show only ended up running two weeks, it was an amazing experience of, of, of watching the best people in the business try to fix a flawed show under massive time pressure. We didn't, we didn't try out out of town. There was no first draft of Merrily. I mean, we, we, we performed what we had rehearsed and the audience hated it as we started previews. And over the next, it ended up being six weeks, I think, uh, as they postponed and postponed again, our, our poor opening. Uh, they, they never stopped working on the show. You know, the, Steve would come in with new lyrics, new songs, new endings. The script was constantly being 
um, cut and changed and we rehearsed every single afternoon and occasionally on our days off, Mr. Prince would you know, ask us if we would volunteer to, to rehearse on our days off. And we'd say, yes, of course, Mr. Prince, yes. Um, we, won't, we all wanted it to be a hit so badly and it was not. <laughs> it's come back, it's done well since then. It, it has, well, it's a magnificent score. We recorded the album for the show the day after we closed. Uh, and it, you can hear our enthusiasm for the piece on that on that album. We loved it so much. Um, for years, nobody, you know, people just sort of turned up their nose at it like it was yesterday's trash. But the quality of the score, I think, really comes through. Um, and once it was removed from sort of the the odor of our production. <laughs> People have recognized the score for for being the masterpiece that it is. I think. That's right. You know. right. Okay, so obviously you then got into musical director direction and directing. So, um, how what exactly is that for people that don't know what it is? Uh, it's a good question because a lot of people don't don't know what a music director does, and a lot of people in the business don't really know everything that a music director does. I'm basically responsible for everything musical in the entire production. Um, you know, it's my responsibility to deliver to the composer the score that he composed and in the way that he and the team wanted sung and played um, by the cast and musicians. So, you know, starting with the, the first auditions for the, you know, the chorus and all of the casting meetings and sessions for the for the principals. I'm there to make sure that the score is going to be sung in the way that we need it. You know, if we need strong pop singers, you know, can they belt high enough? If we, if it's a legit score, make sure the sopranos have creamy high notes and um, monitoring what's happening musically um, at, at every point in the, in the process. Some, depending on the composer, sometimes that includes doing vocal arrangements, you know, figuring out what the ensemble is going to sing in certain places, if that's not a strength of the composer. Sometimes I also do dance arrangements, meaning the, you know, constructing the music that's played between people singing when they're just dancing, working with the choreographer on, on things like that. Uh, it was, with some of the composers I work for, they do all that themselves and others um, are more collaborative in that uh, end of the, of the process. And then rehearsing the orchestra and uh, making sure that the orchestration has lived up to what the conductor and everybody, I mean, what the composer and everybody wanted. Um, and then actually conducting the show and then hopefully maintaining the show for the many years that the show runs. Um, being responsible for the music at all times through that process. So it's, it's a long, complicated job of sort of musical minutia managing and you exist in a in a sort of an odd place i'm part performer you know conducting the show each night and part creative teams just, you know sitting back and and trying to see the whole and giving notes and maintaining the quality of the run it sounds complicated and like a, a lot of responsibility goes into that <laughs> it it's, it can be an exhausting job on, on, a, on a big show. Uh, it's, it's sort of a never ending fountain of, the da of daily problems to be solved. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Um, well I, I mean, part, it's, it's part of a part two anyway. So, um, yeah. so how, did, how, did, how did like anyone kind of get started in musical direction? Uh, well, most of us come up from the piano bench. <laughs> You know, you start out as the audition pianist or um, the rehearsal pianist for a show. Um, that's how I started. I, I started playing auditions in New York and um, playing rehearsals, playing dance rehearsals for people. Uh, when I had been doing Mary Luby Roll Along, the, the music director was uh, Paul Gemignani, who is considered sort of one of the great all-time Broadway music directors. and. He has a very strong presence in the pit. And uh, I just 
thought he looked like how he was having so much fun doing his job that I kind of wanted to be down there, not up on the stage where I didn't actually really feel that comfortable or feel that I was talented enough to, to, to last in a, in a, in a profession as challenging and soul crushing as being an actor yeah. in New York or anywhere. Um, but, but Paul seemed like he was having a really great time with his job. So I kind of recalibrated where I wanted to be in musical theater. I looked for jobs playing what we call summer stock over here. Uh, is there a British word for that? I don't know. What the... I don't know. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> summer stock in the States is well, we did 12 shows in 12 weeks over the course of a summer. Uh, oh my. It was a non union theater. And we, re we would rehearse for six days during the day and then do the show at night and then start rehearsing the next one immediately. Uh, I don't know if we have yeah. anything quite that exciting. Well, lucky <laughs> you. <laughs> oh my gosh. It's okay. basically enforced slavery. <laughs> we're on, a, <laughs> oh my we're on, on an island off New Jersey, uh, Long Beach Island, and uh, for no money and terrible food, we did 12 shows in 12 weeks. But it was a great way to learn scores and to learn to learn how to do things as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible. Um, and lessons I, I learned on that island come back and help me every now and then. So I've always been grateful for those two horrible summers. <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised, though. The, they, yeah, that would sound like it would really teach you some things. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And watching how people respond in that kind of pressure cooker uh, was interesting as well. Yeah. So did you um, did you go to university and get a degree in directing? Is that a thing? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think there are degrees in music directing. I went to Yale undergraduate and I was a music major there. Okay. Um, I, I took what I thought was going to be a huge leave of absence, you know, for years and years to go do Mary Libby Roll along on Broadway. But after one, after missing one semester at Yale, I was back at Yale and I finished up. But you know what, there may be graduate programs now that do have degrees in theatrical music direction, but that, that did not exist when I was um, coming up through the ranks. Basically, the, the only way to learn it is to do it. And I think summer stock was my was my cauldron of introduction to how to music direct efficiently and quickly. Yeah, I'm sure there are programs at drama school for yeah, direction. I'm, maybe. I, I'm, I, I need, I to, I need to look know. into it. I don't, I don't <laughs> actually sure. know. Not 100% sure. Um, okay, so, I mean, slightly off the topic, but have you ever worked over in uh, the UK or England or whatever? Oh, yes, I, I love coming over to London. Uh, the production of She Loves Me that I did in New York, uh, we mounted in in the West on the West End, and that was a great experience. It was it was funny um, with that with that production. The costumes were identical, the wigs were identical between the two productions, and somehow they cast it with actors that looked kind of the same, and you know under the lights and in the same set. It, Sometimes I couldn't even tell which country I was in. Wow. It was, it was, it was, I haven't had that experience on any other show, but those those two productions looked identical, and uh, it, was, it was fun. It was fun doing. She loves me in the West End. It starred Ruthie Henschel, oh, yes. and um, a wonderful guy. I was, damn, I, last name I can't remember. Gordon, Gordon something. They were great. They were great. Uh, <laughs> Not ended up doing a, conducting a concert of uh, ragtime in Wales uh, with the Cardiff Symphony with Maria um, <laughs> the name's gone <laughs> it's so terrible her sister Sonia is a fantastic producer I don't know if I know Maria do you know Maria? I can't think of Maria it, Great West End actress. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, have a look. <laughs> Can't remember her name. <laughs> anyway, that was a fun experience too. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's 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 very different over in the West End compared to Broadway. I don't know how it like I'm talking like shows wise. I don't know how it runs over in Broadway because I've not worked <laughs> there obviously. But yeah, the the UK it's just it's just so different, isn't it? They're both very different worlds, but they both have the same well, yeah. How do you think they're different? You, well, which we we've been we've worked in the West End and we've been to Broadway to see shows and just I don't know it just it it feels different like I don't know if that's just because it's different actors and they just act shows differently to over here like I, I think know. I think the, the difference between like I well for me it's I don't know, I feel like the 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 whole event of going to a Broadway show is much more spectacular spectacular and it's a it's a full it's a full evening whereas i feel like in the west end it's i don't know it feels more like easily accessible like it just feels yeah. like you can just kind of turn up it's a more normal thing to be going to a play yeah but then as opposed th- to twice a year dressing up in a party dress and yeah, yeah it felt like more extravagant like we had to i mean we didn't really but like it felt like <laughs> more like you have to dress up and like kind of like old school like you have to dress up, and it's like a, an experience when you go to Broadway. Whereas in the West End, we're just like, oh, quick, let's get some twenty quid rush tickets and go see a show. Yeah. I don't know, but that's maybe that's just because that's our country and that's where we're from, and we're close by, and we just go. I don't know. I'm not yeah, sure. No, I don't know. It's but... probably that, but yeah. I know. What you, I know what you're saying, uh, and I, I love that aspect of being in London and going to Leicester Square and seeing what what happens to be cheap that night and just yeah. taking a play you've never heard of. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is the best bit. <laughs> <laughs> we should do that more, to be honest. We really should, we really <laughs> should do that more, but... We're a bit planner. Is it your turn? This... Yes, it is. Okay. Oh, the dog's off. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> what was your favourite show that you've ever conducted? Ooh, that's hard. I was going to say, <laughs> if you can even answer that one. <laughs> um, well... Conducting Sweeney Todd was with a full orchestra, which I got finally to do uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, was a lifelong dream come true. I think that is one of the finest scores ever constructed. And it's one of those shows that I fell in love with and, and started stalking as soon as I saw it, the original production. Uh, when I was in high school, a school trip that my theater teacher um, put together took a you know, busload of 20 of us to New York and when we saw Sweeney Todd and it really changed my life. I mean, seeing that huge stage filled with those amazing actors, we had alarmingly good seats for a school group and I couldn't move after the, after the end of the first act, I was so stunned by what had happened. And I just sat like stone through intermission and then through the second act and um whenever i could get 30 dollars collected together after that i would go see Sweeney Todd again um and to finally conduct it with it with a with a big orchestra was, was a thrill it didn't disappoint <laughs> yeah um Rand time was a a complete joy to conduct i conducted it for two years on broadway and would gladly have continued if it had run longer um the orchestration was so powerful in that show. Bill Brown was the orchestrator, and he's just, he was an amazing master of color and using the orchestra to define theatrically the three different strands of storytelling that, that wind through ragtime. It was, it was brilliant, his work on that. The way the, the New, New Rochelle ensemble would, would be orchestrated differently from the Harlem ensemble and the immigrant ensemble they had all these klezmer instruments hidden in the orchestra and tubas and banjos and honky tonk pianos it's a master of color my goodness that's a lot <laughs> it's quite it's quite cool though that you went like when you were young you went and saw a show and you loved it and then as an adult you got to conduct like you know sweeney todd you got to conduct it i think that's really cool yeah, and so often those dreams don't work out the way you, you think they're going to. Yeah. You know, the, the things you're sure you wanted um, can sometimes disappoint, but in that case it did not. Yeah, it must have been a bit, um, what's the word, surreal? Is that yeah. a word? Yeah. Well, well you, you find yourself in, in your 
12 year old body again, you know, hearing that music for the first time, even as you are, you know, a much older person <laughs> working with the same score. Yeah, that's mad. Um, okay. Is there a show that you've always wanted to conduct but haven't yet? Mm. You know what I would love to, to, to conduct sometime is a beautiful piece that we, I don't know if it's been to London called The Light in the Piazza. Yes, yes it, it has. has. It just recently came over. Yeah. Beautiful score by Adam Gettle um, that was done at the Lincoln Center Theatre in, in New York. And that was a show as an adult that I had the same reaction to when I used to see theatre as a kid, you know, which I, I, I miss now having that that thrill of seeing a show when I was a kid. But The Light in the Piazza did that that same thing for me. Um, it was beautifully constructed, interesting story, amazing music, and and a very actor-dependent kind of theater. You know, it wasn't about fancy tricks. It was about it was about what the actors were doing with those songs and the and the story. And that's to me the the best kind of theater. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. I didn't get to see it uh, in London, but it was very highly recommended yes and praised everyone was going to see it it was one of them shows that everyone was just like you need to see it go yeah, see it we did not <laughs> unfortunately we missed out but we can't see everything well uh, we try our best but <laughs> no you it'll can't cu- see it will come back around again i'm, I'm sure, sure it'll it will. be fine well if it was that highly recommended and acc- acclaimed that's probably not the right word but you know if it was that highly recommended then surely it was praised enough that it might come back if not we'll just come over to broadway and I have to see it when it comes. Have yeah. to come and see that, and then maybe you'll be conducting it, and then oh, okay. it's all good. <laughs> How many dreams come true would that be? <laughs> that would be. I can't go. <laughs> what is it? You next? Okay. okay. <laughs> Just put um, it down. I don't know. I put it down. So yeah. Um, okay. So we. So our our podcast is called Showtime Shenanigans. So I was wonder, wondering if you had any. Showtime what? So our Showtime shenanigans. So shenanigans means when something goes like wrong. So know, yeah. But, but um, so have you ever had any like funny like moments where you've gone wrong whilst doing working on a show? Ah, okay. Um, that shenanigans. Um, well, I have some funny stories from Merrily actually. During those um, previews, we would um, you know, every night we were putting in new material to the show and which is a hard thing to do you know you you rehearse the new material in the afternoon and you put it in sort of blind to the production that night and hope it goes well <laughs> and we had we had spent the whole afternoon rehearsing a new transition um between scenes and the transitions in merrily were very complicated because merrily we were along that backwards so the transitions were always there to take us back in time and um, Mr. Sondheim had been rewriting them sort of one by one through the whole show during previews. So we were, we had rehearsed a new transition, you know, about 10 of us in the, in the group. And um, we charged out on stage doing this new piece that we'd spent the day rehearsing. And the orchestra was playing the old version oh, from the night before. The, the copyists had forgotten to, you know, to, to distribute the new music or some some terrible thing had happened in the, in the pit. So they, the orchestra was playing one song, and we were doing the other song. We nothing could stop us. We were we were programmed and determined to execute what we had heard that afternoon. It was a cacophony to say the least, and I'm sure the audience thought that Mr. Sondheim had written very atonal music that night. <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> that's not what you want is it <laughs> oh, Early also had this turntable that all the furniture would come out on and you know, sometimes s- scenery would rotate on for for um scenes that had been cut that day you know and <laughs> so the wrong set would be on stage or it would be facing the wrong way um, you know, because some cut in the music and all of a sudden there wasn't enough time to, to rotate the turntable the, the proper amount. You never knew where that turntable was going to stop during previews. Oh, dear. 
<laughs> I think I think they're trying to phase out revolves, aren't they? A bit, I feel. Yeah, they seem to be stopping a lot of the revolves. Just don't seem to be a thing anymore. And it's quite sad. I do. I miss a good revolve. They, yeah, they keep. They, I think they're getting rid of them. <laughs> I spent a year and a half with Les Mis on tour, oh. uh, which has the revolve of all revolves, and it was a night in Washington D.C. where the, for some reason they hadn't. I think between shows they always had to unwind the revolve. On Les Mis, and they had forgotten to do that between shows. So the when the evening show started, the, for some reason the turntable was going the opposite direction that the actors had expected. So they would step onto the revolve, expecting it to go, you know, to the right, and instead it would sweep them to the left. And of course they would fall on their asses and <laughs> drop all their props. And, oh no! Um, the candlesticks were flying into the orchestra pit. None of the actors could stay. Um, on their feet because they were so programmed to, to expecting the ground to be shifting a certain way and instead it was shifting the other way. They quickly stopped the show and gathered up their wreckage oh, no. <laughs> on, the, on the turntable to the right place and we started again. But oh. that was a tragic night. <laughs> we uh, we worked at um, Les Mis in London and they when we joined that's when they got rid of the revolve so we didn't have those issues luckily <laughs> we both in the show uh, we wish no we were front of house so ushers um so yeah <laughs> it's just it, other things would go wrong but um yeah we heard we heard horror stories about the revolve not okay not horror stories but like just where it would just always go wrong which is why they took it out when they renovated the theater um yeah yeah it wasn't good <laughs> <laughs> As I say, the, the best kind of theatre is the theatre that re re relies on the actors and not the revolve. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think that's all we have. Um, was okay. there, was, there, <laughs> was there anything that you, well, I mean, you have your book coming out, if you could just tell us, you know, just tell us a little snippet. That? I know, but like, oh, tell ahead. us just a little bit about sure. what, what it is again and just tell us when it's coming sure. out and all that. Thank you. It's called Facing the Music by David Loud, and it's being published by Regan Arts. It should be out for Christmas. And it's about my love of the theater and what took me there and what it means to be a Broadway music director. Um, and uh, it also deals with my coming out and my coming out as a person with Parkinson's, which uh, uh, happened towards the end of my time music directing shows on Broadway. Um, and uh, it's pretty funny and has lots of shenanigans stories in it. Yeah. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> I'll be I'm making sure to buy it straight away. And yeah, I'll have get it, it as a Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> Super. Make a great Christmas present for anybody who loves theatre. Maybe I'll, I'll get it for my mum. I'll buy I'm buying it I'll just, <laughs> straight away. I'm going to go in and... Just... Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been... What a pleasure to talk great. to you. I'm glad we we sorted out the hiccup with the Zoom call. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, technology, honestly. <laughs> uh, two different countries, they barely speak the same language. And yeah. We're going. <laughs> um, yeah, well, maybe we'll see you sometime. I don't know. You I never know what's going to happen in the theatre world. <laughs> yeah, come over again. Come over to the UK. We'll say hi. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much for watching our interview with David Loud. We thoroughly enjoyed it. I was about to say that. <laughs> I'm glad. Yes. Um, we, like I said earlier, we'll put the links down below if they're there. If we haven't got it yet, I'll put it in later. But yes, um, once again, thank you to, for David for being our first Broadway American man. On Broadway our American man. Do you mean Broadway, someone from Broadway, yeah. not the West End? Yeah. Yeah, what an icon. I just, he was great. It was it's nice really learning nice about him. Learning about, yeah, learning about him, learning about Broadway. We talked about some differences, yeah. which was interesting. We learned something. What was that thing he said? That summer thing? Yeah. That was really cool. I didn't know that existed. I'm going to look into that. That sounds like fun. 12 shows in 12 weeks. Jesus Not about Christ. that life. Imagine being the actors in that as well. Oh. Oh. Anyways. Um, but yeah, see you next week with another episode. Adios. Bye.